And I want to share with you uh, a little bit this morning uh, a very practical thing. I want to share a very practical word with you this morning that I believe will speak to your hearts and uh, give you a little understanding and, uh, and, and help us in our walk with the Lord. Amen. And so the last few weeks, uh, we've been sharing about servanthood, about what it means to be uh, a servant, okay? And uh, I, I believe uh, one of the greatest kingdom principles is the call to be a servant. And this great truth is uh, exemplified, no doubt, uh, in the words of Jesus himself, amen? He said, the Son of Man did not come to earth to be served, he said, but he came to serve. Wow. He turned to his disciples and said, the greatest among you shall be servant of all. Wow, that's heavy, isn't it? Paul wrote to the Philippians and he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, that although he was God, emptied himself, humbled himself, and took the form of man, of a servant, and was obedient even unto death. Wow, that's the mind of Christ. That's what it means to be a servant. And Paul also wrote to the Romans and said, let a man examine himself to see if he really be in the faith. In other words, if we're called to walk like Jesus walked, if he's the model older brother, if we've been conformed into his likeness and that's what Christianity is all about, then really we're going to demonstrate our new birth and the fact that we're new creations by being like him, right? There's going to be fruit for our repentance. There's going to be something about our life that demonstrates openly that Jesus indeed is Lord and he lives in our life. And so, uh, very important. And I believe that we need to come to that place to examine that. Are we being a good steward? Do we understand? Are we servants? God's given us all gifts, right? Every one of us has gifts and talents and abilities. We don't want to be like the guy that took his gifts and talents and hit them in the earth or hit them in a napkin. And then when the Lord returned, he, he had to count them. Was it, that was a very difficult time. You might say, well, I don't have many gifts. I don't have talents like other people. Don't ever say that. I rebuke you. Don't say those things because God has given you a measure and it's all you need. And all he's saying is be faithful in the little. Be faithful in what you know you have received. What gift, talent do you have? Be faithful in it, in the little. And the scriptures say God will bring greatness. God will multiply it. God will bring increase. Hallelujah. He's going to come and he's going to call us all to an account. What did you do with the abilities, the giftings, and the talents that I gave you? And you know what it also says? Not only will he bring increase if you're just faithful with the little, he said he'll take gifts from others that have not been faithful and give them to you. That's amazing. One day, we will stand before the Lord and we want to hear this. Well done. Thou good and faithful teacher. I mean, worship leader. I mean, intercessor. <laughs> well done, thou good and faithful servant. We all can serve. We all can serve. Now, with this in mind, I want to share again a very practical message that I believe will uh, help clarify and bring the balance between <laughs> do we worship or do we work? Do we pray or do we serve? Do we minister to the Lord in, in the spirit and, and into his divinity? Or do we minister to the Lord physically in his service? What is the balance? Do I worship? Am I called to worship and minister to the Lord like Mary? Or am I called to minister to the Lord and serve and work and bless and, 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 and work and help people and, and serve like Martha, her sister? How many know the answer? Both. Martha. Yes, Martha. Martha and Mary together, right? The balance. We've got, we have to learn the balance. Do I minister to Mary? Do I minister like Mary? Worship like Mary? Or do I serve like Martha? Yes. Yes, we need to learn the balance. Okay? So, are you a Mary or a Martha? Are you a Mary 
or a Martha this morning. Oh, this word, I want to share something. That's so simple, but it will speak to you. Lord, speak to us deeply and clearly and help us to understand. Can you have the spiritual genetic predisposition, the, the, the makeup in your personality and temperament to be predominantly one other than the other? Sure you can. But does that excuse you from not operating and flowing in the other realm? No. Hallelujah. God wants to bring the understanding and the balance. So to understand what we've shared, to understand, Lord, how do I grow and mature in you? How do I learn how to minister and worship you like Mary? And how do I truly be a faithful servant like Martha? Then we simply need to go to the scriptures and see how they interacted and see the dynamics that's at work, right? Between them, and it will speak to us, right? So before we go to the account of Mary and Martha in the gospel, before we visit their house in Bethany, we need to visit another house. Bethlehem. Hallelujah. Now, amazing. Jesus' first encounter, his very first encounter and experience with mankind, his creation. When he emptied himself of his deity, he came to earth. His very first encounter with those who created mankind, right? Think about it. He comes to Bethlehem, he's born on the earth, and there's a no vacancy sign, or no room, <laughs> right? Come on, no room. <laughs> We've had trouble with this thing for some reason for a couple weeks now. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Devil, get out of that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Have you ever thought Jesus went from a borrowed womb to a borrowed tomb? Think about it. Constantly in his life on earth, looking for a place to find rest. Looking for a place that truly welcomed him. Right? Looking for a place where he was comfortable and he could express himself. And I think you'd agree with me. Not too much has changed. Not too much has changed over the last hundred years, over the last two millennium. Because he's still looking for a place. Jesus is looking for a place that he can come and he feels welcomed and loved and received. And he can have full expression. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to think of something. There are churches all over America today. And they have a beautiful facility. And maybe outside that facility in the front there, there's a marquee. And it says First Baptist Church. Or maybe it says Third Congregational Church. Or maybe it says River of Life or Pentecostal Holiness. It doesn't matter what the denomination. That's not what's important here. The fact of the matter is, tragically, if we could see by the Spirit, there's another sign hanging underneath that marquee sign that says No Vacancy. Because in fact, we call ourselves a church who welcomes the Lord. But how many churches are so full with man's agendas, man's plans, man's programs, man's idea, that if someone ever walked into the church pregnant with the purposes of God, there'd be no place to give birth because truly they weren't given place and they weren't welcome, let alone Jesus himself. Jesus is still looking for a place where he's received and he's comfortable to give himself full expression. I pray to God there's never a no vacancy sign before this church. Can you say amen? Jesus said something profound. Remember when the, that, that disciple came and uh, was thinking of following Jesus and he said something hmm, pretty interesting. He said, well, listen, let me share something with you. Foxes have holes <laughs> and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Wow, that's pretty deep. And I believe he was doing more than uh, just sharing with him. Oh, by the way, I don't know that you realize, but if you want to be my disciple, it's not going to be real comfortable. 
uh, itinerant ministry is difficult. I don't have a home. I don't even have a home base. I'm trusting my father every day where I live, where I stay, what I do. It, it's not what you call the easy, comfortable life. But I believe he's also sharing a great principle and a great truth. He's saying something that he see, you see throughout his ministry. He said it more than one time in more than one way. I am looking for a place. I'm looking for a place where I'm received and I feel comfortable and I feel welcome. How many of you want to be that place? Right? Come on. Thank God we're, we're not left without an answer. Well, how are we going to be that place, Lord? Well, look at the Gospels and look at the life of Jesus and you will find there was a place. There was a place outside of Jerusalem, a little town called Bethany. And there was a family there named Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And it seems like Jesus always frequented that place. That was the go-to place for Jesus. Whenever he wanted a little R&R, &R, he wanted to hang out with good friends. And most of all, he knew he was welcomed and loved and accepted. And he could be himself. He would end up in Bethany at their house. Amen? Now. I want to go to that portion of scripture that we're all familiar with, read it, and we're going to ask God to show us in a different light, give us a fresh perspective on some things. And I think it'll, I think it'll help us, encourage us. Let's look at that, can we? Luke chapter 10. Now it came to pass as they went, he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha. Okay, Martha received him into her house. You see that? Let's go on. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about, much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sisters left me to serve alone? Please tell her to come help me. And Jesus said, oh, Martha, Martha. You are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which shall be not taken away from her. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to... Okay, that's, that's next time. All right? A lot to unpack here. How many of there's a hundred messages here? <laughs> but we're going to look at the dynamics and the tensions between these two sisters, okay? Their motivations and their giftings. But here's the key thought. For every Bethlehem we have in this city, for every religious institution, no matter what its name, for every Bethlehem with a no vacancy sign, God, raise up a Bethany. We need God to raise up the house of Bethany in the, in the city, amen? Simply the place where Jesus knows he's welcome, he's loved, He's received. He can have full expression. Now, in case you haven't noticed, if you've been around the church any length of time, probably 90% of the messages you hear kind of rebuke Martha, right? Isn't that true? I've preached that. It's the truth in this. And we like to get on Martha because, you know, Martha, why were you so insensitive? And uh, we, we kind of get on her case. But I think there's a, a deeper message here. If we really look at this from a wider lens, you might say, I believe God wants to speak and show us something. So why was Jesus so blessed that he found rest in this one particular house in Bethany? Because he was ministered to both as the son of God and as the son of man. Was Jesus not the son of God? Simply meaning he is the embodiment of who God is. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. I'm walking on earth. I'm very God. But he was also, and he referred to himself as the son of man, meaning he embodied in every way who a man was that was full of God, a, 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 cre a creature that's been born again and walks with relationship with God. He's the son of God and he's the son of man. Well, Martha and Mary each ministered to a different part of his being. Mary ministered to the Son of God, to his divinity. How? She sat at his feet. She worshipped him. She loved him. She heard and received the word. She prayed to him. She had intimacy and fellowship with him. But Martha ministered to his natural man, the Son of Man. Come on. Martha welcomed him into the house. Martha cooked a good meal. How many know Jesus probably enjoyed a good meal? 
Of course he did. Martha made a point to make sure that it was a nice warm house. It was clean. I have to believe she fluffed up the bed and made sure there was fresh sheets. Maybe in the morning she drew a warm bath. I promise you this, when he left the next day, he was carrying a basket full of food. Right? Martha was ministering to Jesus' humanity. Sometimes we forget Jesus was a man. Jesus was a human being just like you and I. He had very real needs. He got tired. He got weary. Right? He got discouraged. He got everything. Everything he experienced, the Bible tells us. And so she was used, God used her to minister to his very real needs. So, the houses that Jesus is drawn to today, the Bethany's that he wants to raise up, understand what it means to minister both to his, man, his normal, physical, natural needs and to his spiritual, divine need. Now, how do we minister to Jesus' humanity? Well, he's not here. We understand that. But are we not his body? We are his body. And when we minister and serve one another, we are serving him and blessing him because we are his body. When we minister and serve people out there, outside this church, we are ministering to him. In other words, we have a vertical ministry to Jesus, divine. We've got a horizontal ministry to those outside and those around us. That's the cross, amen. What's the greatest com uh, commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. And, and, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in every church, <laughs> there are Marthas and there are Marys. And one's not greater than the other. Despite what we've heard. One's not greater than the other. Martha and Mary. Are you a Martha or are you a Mary? Every one of you have a predominant inclination, you may say, all right, or motivational gifting. You're going to find yourself gravitating one way or the other. Well, if you're a Mary, what's, I mean, a Martha, let's start with Martha. What's Martha? She's a doer. She's a go-getter. She's an action person. She's a type A personality. She's saying, hey, there's a, there's a need. Let's go meet that need. Let's get it done. Let's do something. Right? She's the one that, she's the administrator, the strategist, the implementer. She's the one that says, let's put together a committee and let's get a plan and let's get on it. Let's get the job done. She likes to cook. She likes to make a meal. She wants to clean the church. She wants a plan for the visitors. Right? She wants to go out to the byway and into the city and the marketplace and heal the sick and cast out devils and preach the gospel and serve. She says, you know, I don't want to just pray about it. Come on, let's go. Let's do it. Right? <laughs> Martha, Martha. And that's why Martha, the Marthas in the church, tend to get a little attitude. And you can understand why when you really, if you're a Martha, you do. <laughs> you get a little understanding why at times they get a little impatient and can even cop an attitude toward the Marys. Now, if you like a clean house and a great meal, then lay off the Marthas. Right? Come on, cut Martha some slack. You like a clean church? Hallelujah. Now, how about Mary? Mary's a worshiper. Mary just wants to be at the feet of Jesus. Mary is absolutely fulfilled. She's in ecstasy just being at the presence of the Lord, worshiping, praying, interceding, talking to God, locking in on his every word, listening to the word of the Lord. How many know that's good? I mean, Mary has this single devoted, single, single eye and mind devotion to be with Jesus. That's, that's all I need. That fu fulfills me. That satisfies me. Mary has dreams and visions and revelations. Isn't that good? Mary wants to go to the prayer meeting. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hmm. 
Martha comes and says, Mary, I hear your cry for the lost. I hear you praying for this city. Why don't you get up and join me? Let's go in and do something about it. Now, which is greater? <laughs> it's not a trick question. They both are legitimate anointings, right? Both of them. Martha says, Mary, you're, I'm hearing your cry. I'm hearing, I'm seeing your prayer. You are so faithful to cry out to God. But hey, faith without works is dead. Get up. I don't want to go and do what you're praying about. Right? Martha understands the words of Jesus. He said, come and enter into the kingdom I prepared for you. Because when I was sick, you ministered to me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was hungry, you gave me food to eat. And when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Jesus said that, folks. Boy, Martha's looking pretty good. <laughs> now, one of the greatest challenges in the church is tearing down the walls that can be erected between the Marys and the Marthas, the Hatfields and the McCoys, no. You can catch an attitude whether you realize it or not. You can get a little attitude at Mary's when they're not helping to serve. And you can get a little you know, self-righteous if you're Mary at, at the Marthas. Come on, people. It's time to pray. Right? Time to pray. Martha, I'm happy you love the Lord and you love to worship him. But you know what? Somebody's cleaning the church. Somebody's getting the work done. Somebody's got to do what is necessary for you to come in and pray. And, and Mary says, well, you're not as spiritual as me, Martha. <laughs> and they always know that scripture. The Lord said, I've chosen the better part, right? Hallelujah. All we need is prayer and worship and to be in God's presence. But if you noticed what we just read, Luke chapter 10, verse 38, it says, Martha welcomed Jesus into the house. Hmm. Thank God for ushers and greeters. <laughs> Think about it. Martha welcomed Jesus into the house. She did the real natural preparations to make him feel welcome. Possibly her ministry of hospitality and service is what created the platform for Mary to have a wonderful time of fellowship with Jesus. That's an interesting thought. <laughs> How many of you remember the Shumanite woman? Shulamite. Shumanite. I don't know if she's a Shulamite or a Shumanite. I think she's a Shumanite. Anyway, remember the gal in 2 Kings. And uh, she noticed that this prophet was walking by her house every once in a while. And she really took note. And she thought to herself, wow, I perceive this is a holy man of God. I, I want to prepare a meal for him. I, I want to prepare a meal for him that when he comes by, he knows he can stop by and, and I can bless him with a good meal. I think you'd agree with me that that prophet appreciated a good warm meal as he's walking down the trail doing his thing, right? And so he, she welcomes him. He comes in and they begin to develop a relationship. And one day she says to her husband, you know what? I got an idea. Let's fix up the upper room. Let, let, let's make a prophet's chamber and let's furnish it with a bed and a, a candlestick and a, and a table and a stool. And anytime this man of God comes by, we can receive him and bless him. And he said, sure, let's do that. And so uh, she welcomed him. You see, I see here a Mary and a Martha. I see a Martha and a Mary flowing together, right? She prepares a place for him and serves and ministers to his very real needs, right? And if you read on, this day comes, and I have to believe that they developed a relationship. I don't believe that he just came in and, and ate and just went up to her. They began to develop a relationship, and, and, and he ministered to her, and he, his, his giftings were released to her. Wow. Her hospitality made room for that anointing. Years later, her, her son was out in the field, drops dead. 
heat exhaustion, uh, heart attack, we're not sure. But she says, all is well, all is well. Bring him up and place him on the bed of the holy man of God. All is well. And we know what happens. The prophet goes up and stretches himself over the dead boy and breathes seven times and resurrection life surges into his body. Hallelujah. I believe that she's demonstrating both both a Martha anointing to serve him and bless him and care for him. At the same time, there's an impartation, a reciprocation. And when it's time for a miracle, come on. When there's time for a miracle, she had made room. She had given place. And there's a whole lot. Uh, I could go off on that about practical things today, but, but I don't have time. But one of the greatest challenges, I believe, in the church Again, is tearing down the walls, tearing down the walls that we build and coming to that place of understanding that Mary and Martha need to minister together, serve together. So, <laughs> ministry to the Lord could begin with preparing a very natural place where he feels comfortable. Should I talk about that? I don't know. There's, there's a real truth in that even in ministering to uh, itinerant ministries or guest ministry. How many know they should be at a comfortable place where they can get something to eat, where they feel uh, a, a, you know, a liberty, where, they, where they're not burdened down? Now, if they're asking to be at a five-star hotel and have sushi delivered, then, you know, <laughs> I don't know about all that. But there's just a principle, a dynamic. Care for their natural needs. Not because they're going to go, well, I like the place they put me, and uh, I, I, I like the way they, they made sure I had good food, and I had good company, and they picked me up on time from the airport, so I guess I'll give myself and really uh, release the anointing. No, 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 no. It's just an unspoken thing. Care for the natural and receive the spiritual. So, so interesting. With all that, this is so interesting to note. It said Mar Martha also sat at his feet. That's what we just read. Martha also sat at his feet, which tells me there was a time in this short time where Jesus came and they had this, this time together. There was a time Martha was also entertaining his presence and at his feet. And also, it says in verse 40, Mary also served. My sister has left me all alone. At some point, Mary was serving and helping Martha. Isn't it interesting when you really stop and look at the scripture? <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> Let's stop and really look at the scripture. In other words, if you look at that portion, it's just not how we've heard it preached often. I mean, Martha is totally oblivious, working. Mary's just absolutely caught up in the presence of God, and there's this great gap. There's something else to be said here. There's another dynamic at work. There was a time where Mary was helping Martha, her sister, serve. There was a time when Martha was with her sister Mary and attending to and ministering to Jesus. So with all these good things and, and, and Martha seeming to do what's right, why does he rebuke her? Or maybe he didn't rebuke her. Maybe he correct her or enlighten her. <laughs> The real issue was that Martha was distracted and encumbered about with many things. She had a lot of things on her head, in her brain, right? Maybe she wasn't being discerning. Maybe she wasn't being sensitive for the moment because at different moments, it requires different responses, okay? She was just all full of cares and distracted when Jesus was in the house. I think you'd agree with me. You, that's easy to do, isn't it? She was encumbered about, which means to drag around weight or a burden. She was lacking discernment. Come on, how many know if the, if the roast has got to come out if, at 4.30 and this has got to happen to that? It, it's going to take your thoughts. It's not like she was clueless here. She was just at the moment when she should have been more aware. She was totally caught up in the Martha thing. Hebrews says, let us lay aside every sin and weight that should easily encumber us. So again, this is not an indictment.
statement so much about Martha. We're going to see the point was this. Jesus was saying, here, let me share something with you. Let me share a little nugget of truth with you. The point is this. At this particular moment, it's best that you be with me, okay? Mary did choose the better part. It's not saying what you're doing, Martha, is not important. Come and hang out. And that doesn't mean if the roast has got to come out of the oven at 4.30, you let it burn. Does this make any sense? In other words, let's just don't give this general indictment here. Let's be sensitive to the situation. Both Mary and Martha were appreciated and they were ministering but at that very point, what, what's the, what, what is it then? What, what, how do you know whether to be a Mary or a Martha? If the manifest glorious presence of the Lord is present, then all heads up, minister to him. Correct? Now, Mary and Martha are family. They live together. And both gifts are vital. But the greatest challenge is not so much, let's sit here and let's all raise our hands. Which one of you are a Mary, predominantly, and which one of you are a Martha? All the Marthas on the right and all the Marys on the left. Uh, no, 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 no. There, here's the real challenge. We're talking about the two personalities. <laughs> We're talking about Mary and Martha that live in your house. We all have a Mary and a Martha living in our house. And that doesn't mean we're bipolar. <laughs> that means we need to learn how to mature, discern, learn how to flow as a Mary when there's a Mary anointing and flow as a Martha when there's a Martha anointing. Hallelujah. And so if you're a healthy, maturing believer, you recognize which is your strength, which is the one that you generally are going to go toward, but you're also aware that I have got to grow and learn how to be more like the other. Boy, that's so... So... Should be a Mary in you. There should be a cry in you. That there's times to pray. There's times to seek God. When there's the call to a prayer meeting, come to the prayer meeting. Don't tell me you're a Martha. When you're a Martha, you realize, come on. As I said, there's time to go to the prayer meeting. If you're Mary, you realize sometimes you got to get up and you got to get involved. You got to work. Come on, you got to serve. The two flow together. So the real sensitivity is knowing what's the season, what's the time, what is God calling us to do? Here's an important truth that I believe will challenge every one of us. Know your predominant anointing, your motivational gifting, you could call it. Enjoy it, flow in it, develop it more. But allow the Lord to show you where there's a deficit, where you tend to go to one, come on, one hand or one personality before the other and be open to let God teach you. Church, we're going to have a Thanksgiving dinner. Hallelujah. Boy, what a great segue. It's not the time for you to slip away and go to prayer. It's not the time for you to go play your instrument. The Martha time when we're finished eating and we all pull together as a team and we work to clean up. Ouch. I'd love to join in, but yeah. <laughs> I'm Mary. Don't you know I'm Mary? Well, Mary, <laughs> hmm. get up and join the team. Nobody is, has the right to be a Mary or a Martha. We join and we flow together. When there's time for a prayer meeting, don't be running all around and say, I've got things to do. Join the prayer meeting, Mary. Boy, this is so deep, isn't it? <laughs> so, God will show you, and God will take you into seasons where he will help you develop your weaker expression. Isn't that amazing how that works? Think back over your life. It's great that you have a tendency to go to your go-to personality or gifting. And, you know, that's where you find security and strength and comfort. But God will deliberately put you in seasons where it seems like your gifting is not working. He'll slam a door down to press you in to begin to develop and learn your other gifting in ministry. Do you believe that? 
Well, I got, mm -hmm. <laughs> I got a, a, a resounding, mm -hmm. <laughs> There's seasons you press in and you worship and you go after God with all your heart. Then there's seasons God says, get up and get to work. And you know what's interesting? If you have a Martha personality, it's a little harder. If you have a Martha personality because you're strong, you're confident, you know your gifts, your abilities, you, you see a problem or a situation, man, you go after it. You go head, headstrong after it. I can deal with this. I've done it before. Nothing's going to get in my way. I have ability, strengths. I have resources, man. I can take care of this. And all of a sudden, God throws a door up and you're banging your head against the door. And he said, <clears throat> excuse me, Martha, I want to help you a little bit. You need to learn the Mary anointing. I'm going to drive you on your knees where you realize I can't get this done. This problem's too great. God's forcing me to get on my knees and begin to press in and seek the Lord. And Mary, everything that happens, well, I'm going to get before God. God's going to show me. I'm just going to pray and say, the Lord, he'll show me. And the Lord says, Mary, get off your knees and use some common sense. Right? Come on, Mary, get up, get off your knees, use some common sense, and go do what you already know you need to do. You don't have to waste time praying about it. Mary can learn from the Marthas. Martha can learn from the Marys. What does Martha learn from Mary? Seek first the kingdom and all things shall be added. If any man lacks wisdom, let him come before the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not under your understanding. There's a time to seek the Lord. But Mary needs to learn from Martha that Martha says, My God, you got the word? You got common sense? Follow the leader. Go with the group. Mary's tend to kind of Sliver over to the side. <laughs> so what was Jesus saying to Martha? Your sister Mary has chosen the better part. Jesus said, the father seeking true worshipers. Mm -hmm. Wow. The father, uh, the word says, Jesus said, you always have the poor among you. You don't always have me. Yeah, see? see? See, Martha? I've chosen the better part. And then Martha could say, yeah, but the Lord said, go out into all the world. And the Lord said, rise up and go. And do. <laughs> it's about being sensitive to what God is saying. Not a contradiction. How many times have we come to church to have a Martha service? We've got the whole thing planned. Well, we're going to worship for this length of time. We've got these songs planned and then uh, maybe a prayer and we have to take the offering. Announcements are important and we need a good message and maybe an altar call, closing song, and uh, we've got Martha at work. And by the way, Martha's not all bad. It's good to have a plan. Right? It's good to have a plan. But if... Jesus shows up, then Martha's plan is out the window and we all become Mary. When, when the presence of God, when the true manifest presence of God shows up, all we need is to be attentive to him, attentive to him. We can have the audio people come down, the TV people come down, the ushers don't have to be out there greeting. Everyone come, the musicians, we all just come at his feet. God's with us. And let me share this. It doesn't happen as often as we think it does. We can be in a wonderful, sweet presence, but oh my God, when the manifest presence, when Jesus is so there, what would we, why would we be arranging chairs and cleaning up stuff? It preempts everything. And you know, when the glory and the presence is really there, just a little pastoral uh, help. Be careful, let's wait. It's such a precious time. We don't want to miss the Lord. We're not biting our nails and skittish and, and nervous about doing something wrong so much. But let's be sensitive. We've got to let the elders lead. And if you have a sense of something, come talk to one of them. Only because that's the order of God. 
Is that all right? And sometimes we all get nervous and we move too quick because we got to do something. (laughs) Pastors are famous for that. Martha I don't know, I can't even read what I wrote. But here's a good principle. If truly honor the Lord, if we truly honor the Lord, we do so by prioritizing his presence over our preparations for his presence. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Our whole heart is, Lord, come. Lord, come. You're our guest, but you're not a guest. We're Bethany. We're Mary and Martha's house. Oh, don't forget Lazarus. Lord, We just want you to come and find pleasure and joy and comfort in our presence. Hallelujah. Can the Lord come and find rest here? Or does he get nervous because we get nervous? Can you imagine if someone came to your house? Somebody come over to your house and, oh, thanks for coming. It's wonderful to be with you. And then all of a sudden you're like this. I know someone that does that. It makes you feel so uncomfortable. Or, or, or you start doing chores, right? While you're sitting there talking, you get up and you start doing things. Like, Paul, it's so awesome to meet with you today, right? Or you go pick up their coat and stand there. It's so great that you've come over, right? Can Jesus feel welcome? Come on. Does Jesus feel welcome in the house? Now, God can call and anoint you to be a Martha if, you're, if you are truly a Mary. It doesn't make you less spiritual. Please hear this. You're not less spiritual if you feel you're predominantly a Martha. I thought of the Good Samaritan. I thought of that guy that got beat up on the road to Jericho. He's laying there, right? The poor guy's laying there dying. And a priest, and a Levite come by. Holy Dudes, right? Maybe they're reading scripture or quoting something or doing something with their beads. They look at the guy and keep walking. Thanks, Martha. But here comes a good Samaritan who had a heart, right, that ministers to this guy. Think about this. On the day of Pentecost, the fire of God falls. All of a sudden, the church is birthed in fiery glory. Revival is breaking forth everywhere. People are being healed, delivered. Oh, my God, the excitement of all that God is doing. Right? Thing. And so in the midst of all of this revival, everyone's caught up in the glory. Everyone's caught up in all that God is doing. And there's a group of folks that walk up to the apostles and they say, Hey, guys, mm, I just want to share something with you. We have a concern. You see, ever since you guys got your hair caught on fire uh, up there on that upper room, there's been a lot of glory and excitement and all kinds of things have been happening, but mm, we're missing something. There's a group of people over here that have some real needs, right? There's widows. There's some people that need to be served and blessed and attended to. The apostles didn't say, hey, don't bother us. We don't have time for that. That's not our concern. The glory of God has come and moving. You know what they did? They said, we need some Marthas. And they appointed from among them seven Marthas full of the Holy Ghost and power who attended to and ministered to the very, very real needs of people. That was just as important as the apostles praying and prophesying and and healing the sick. And have you ever stopped to consider who these Marthas were? They were full of the Holy Ghost. They were powerhouses. Philip. Philip goes to Samaritan, Samaria, and there's a revival breaks out. He's, he's full of signs and wonders. And, and then the Lord says, go to Ethiopia. And he meets the en- uh, Enoch. 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 Eunuch. He meets the eunuch, and he brings the, he brings the gospel to Africa. Then he's translated back to the revival. You want to talk about Stephen. Stephen's a man full of the Holy Ghost and fire. He becomes the first martyr. These men, when they were operating as Martha, they still were Marys. Come on. They still had the anointing and the fire and the glory. It's not one or the other. Isn't that exciting? The apostles didn't say, 
You guys take the lesser thing. We're separating ourselves to pray and seek God and get the word. Wonderful. But they weren't above that and they didn't see themselves as above that because if the need was there, they put down their anointing oil in their Bible and pick up the servant's towel and minister and serve. And we see that was Paul with his credentials. I'm winding down. We're not going to see revival because we gather a bunch of Marys in here and pray and fast and seek God. Now that may mess around with some of your concepts. I'm talking about revival. I'm talking about a move of God that goes out of the building and goes into the community and touches lives. We're not going to see revival just because we find some Marys. I don't care if we find a hundred Marys in greater Salem. We all come here and we pray and fast and cry out to God. We may see the glory. We may see some fire fall. Good. But that's not going to bring a real revival because 99% of the folks out there will never know what's happening in here. Vrai or faux? <laughs> Was that right? What did I say? Vrai ou et faux? True or false? I don't know where that came from. It is French. <laughs> da y niet. <laughs> Only a Russian. Niet. Listen. Most of the people out there, they don't know what's happening in here. They can't relate to it. We can come together as Marys and have a Holy Ghost time and have the glory of God. They don't have a clue. Matter of fact, if you go up to the average person out there on the streets and say, do you know Jesus? They'll look at you like you got two heads. And if they even have heard of Jesus, maybe they know, oh, the dude that died on the cross. Yeah, that's, that's tough. They can't relate. It's irrelevant. They think the church is irrelevant. They think you are irrelevant. They think we're some white-winged winged radical group or something. or They have every kind of concept. They don't know who we truly are, church. But we cannot expect just to be a Mary. We can't expect because we've all been Mary and come in here and we pray and seek the Lord and we receive the anointing. We can't expect we're going to see a revival. we got to get on our Martha clothes, go out there, and we need to touch people. We need to heal, bless, clothe Give them drink. Give them food. What makes us think they're going to be open to our spiritual food when we don't meet their very real physical needs and give them some physical food? Amen. Do you see the dynamic here? Mary and Martha are a team. Mary and Martha are a team. If we're going to be Bethany, we're going to have a team here. We're going to have Marys and Marthas, and we're willing to change hats if we have to, but we're going to work together in unity. We have to be spiritually passionate and socially active if we're going to have a Bethany. My experience in Baltimore, I had a great experience, the tough, good, bad in between. No church is perfect. 18 years. And I can, I can tell you this. We learned the balance. You talk about a Martha church. You talk about a church of outreach and touching people. But when the season came and God separate yourself, we'd have weeks on end where we were at prayer every night. It's true. But here's my point. One of the greatest ministries I was involved with was the jail ministry. Every Saturday night for years, Saturday night, we go to the Baltimore City Jail. We ministered to these guys. We pray for them. We preach to them. And then it, came, it became very evident that they got out. It was time to get out. And they'd say, hey, great preaching. <laughs> I don't have a place to go. Come on. I don't have a place to go. And one night, I brought one guy home with me Saturday night that just got out of jail, did not go over well. <laughs> and I'll leave it right there. Whoo, oh, man. We would minister to drug addicts, and then again, it became apparent. Yes, yes, I want to believe you're meant to, what now? So we opened a Nehemiah house, which is a house that we put our trained people in that was a place where they could live, like a halfway house and work with them. I think the greatest thing I experienced personally was the hiding place. My wife would go down to 
Planned Parenthood and do street counseling, sidewalk counseling. And as the, the, as the ladies were coming in to get an abortion, they'd say, listen, wait, can we pray with you? Can we talk to you? There's a better way. There's something, you know, share the gospel. And one day, one of them said, okay, this is the truth. I won't go in. I won't get my abortion. Great words. What are you going to do to help me? And it became apparent. We need to do something, Martha. Martha needs to kick in. What did we do? We established a hiding place where we became the house parents and brought in all these pregnant girls. And to this day, it's still there. And hundreds of babies have been saved because it was more than just preaching to them. We made a place where we could welcome them and meet their very real needs. And let me tell you, 90% of that ministry was Martha stuff. I think you know what I mean. And I'm, when I look back at the history of this church, I see, I see patterns. I see ebbs and tides and flows and all that. I just see, you know, patterns. And, and it's okay. It's not right or wrong. And there seems to be seasons where we were like more in the Martha mode. And then there were seasons we were really in the, the Mary mode. Right? And it's not right or wrong, as I said. But there's been seasons when the Martha mantle was upon this church. We would renovate Highland Avenue. Everybody came out. Everyone came out and put on their Martha attire. And we renovated. We painted. We worked. Three nights a week, all day Saturday. And the, and the ladies that maybe couldn't work and couldn't sweep or whatever, they made meals and they came and they fed us on Saturday and we all gave all our money. You see this place? This place is because of faithful servants that gave a lot of money and came and did all the work. If you would have seen the before and after picture of this place, your jaw would drop open. Many of you, you, some of you were there. It was a Martha season. I think the past few years we've been in a merry mode. I'm just musing. Is that all right? And there's nothing wrong with that. This is a house of prayer. <laughs> it's been that different season. And we've been pressing in and praying, seeking God. It's good. But something has come very real to me that we got to get back in balance because this church is going to grow. And we're not going to fulfill our potential and our purpose if we just lock into one mode. We can pray all we want, but somewhere we, we need to put on our Martha clothes and go out and tell some people about Jesus. Go out and serve and bless. I'm not saying you don't. I'm talking about in general. How many can hear this? I'm closing. I'm closing. Does that resonate at all with you? We're in a merry mode. Nothing wrong with it. I don't care if we pray for six straight months every night. We may have a good experience, but we also have to be Martha and learn how to take that and carry it to the people in a very real way. And every one of you have a testimony of somebody you ministered to in a natural realm which opened their heart to receive. If you would have hit them as, with a, if you would have hit them as Mary, you would have blown them away probably. So if we're going to be a Bethany church, the house that Jesus loves to live and dwell in and manifest his power. Come on. We got to learn how to be ambidextrous. We got one hand and serve people, serve man, be a servant. And we got to lift the other hand and like Mary, worship, pray, intercede. Danny, could you come just, I'm going to close. Give these folks hope. I am closing. But this last scripture, look at John chapter 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Now watch. There they made him a supper. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. This is at the very end. This is right before his his. Passion, the end of it all. Martha serves Lazarus. She's, he's just sitting as one of them at the table. And what did Mary do? And took Mary 
a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with a sweet aroma. That's so powerful. This is the last time we see Jesus frequenting Bethany. He's about to enter into his crucifixion. He goes to the place he's comfortable, feels welcome. And what do we see? There's Martha. She's still serving. She's getting everything ready. Lazarus, what do you do after you've been raised from the dead? I don't know. He's just sitting there <laughs> resting. <laughs> and Mary, true to her nature and her gifting, breaks the alabaster box and ministers to the Lord. And here is the key. You go home and study it yourself, Mary and Martha. There's no contention. There's no agitation in battle. There's no division. There's no situation, no conflict, no arguments. Everyone's comfortable doing what they do. And it was Martha's hospitality, no doubt. It was Martha's preparation. And it was, it was Mary's heart to worship as they just simply flowed together. What did it bring? The presence and the glory of God. Stand with me. How simple is that? Think about it. How simple is that? Are you Mary? Or are you Martha? How about I'm both? And where you feel where your weaker area is, feel it as a word of encouragement this morning. That God wants to work in us, not only that we're a servant, not only do we rise up and we're quick to volunteer and we work and we do, but oh, there's that part of us that just wants to be in his presence and worship. And when we come together, the house is clean. The ushers have welcomed. Everybody's doing their part. Thank God for the Marthas. Do you like a warm, well, a <laughs> warm, are you chilly or warm? Do you like a clean house? Do you like, come on, you may have an anointing on your life and a gifting, and you know what may be hindering you? The fact that God is saying, I want you to be a little bit more like a Martha and be a little more committed. Be a little more mm -hmm, committed in natural things that can help enhance your anointing. Well, Father, back to expectations and laying it all down in surrender. Sometimes in marriages, You've got a merry partner, M-A-R-Y, and you're a Martha personality. Don't get upset with them. Don't get upset with them. Appreciate them. Learn from them. Receive from them. Right? Mary and Martha make a team. Make your house a Bethany where God's glory can dwell. Lord, Help us, each of us, this morning receive this simple truth and help us to grow and to learn so that we might be a house that carries your presence and your glory in. Can you receive that this morning? Very simple truth, but let it, let it resonate in your heart. Hallelujah.